this week really starts the kind of the meat of the content of this class, which is really focused on like everything that you need to know about turning machine learning projects into like working production systems other than training models. And so to start off with, we're gonna talk about setting up machine learning projects, right? So how to, how to pick projects and how to set them up for success. So I kind of like this characterization of machine learning projects in part because it's so out of date. So this is an XKCD cartoon from not that long ago, which kind of makes this, this quip that like, you know, if you if you try to articulate to someone outside of computer science, like what's what problems are still hard in CS, it, it can be really challenging, right? Because why why like why should it be so hard to recognize a photo of a bird? But kind of the funnier thing about this to me is that this is now so comically out of date, right? Like I think for for all of us who have uh, spent time in the machine learning world, like this is just one API call away. And so I think it it, it articulates how difficult it can be to understand what problems are going to be challenging in machine learning. Another statistic I'll point you to if you spend time looking around the production machine learning world and blog posts and stuff like that, you'll see this statistic come up. 85% of AI projects fail. I've seen it attributed to different places and that sometimes people say 87%, sometimes they say 85%. So I think, you know, maybe not so important to, to actually, you know, know the, the exact numbers in the statistic because I'm not like, not even totally sure how they came up with it, but I think it kind of captures the sentiment that is out there, which is that, it's really, really hard to make machine learning projects work in the real world. And the more interesting question is, you know, whether it's 85% or 50% or whatever, why are so many machine learning projects failing? So I think there's kind of like one core reason, which is that, you know, machine learning to a large extent, there, there's a lot that we can do to make it feel more like engineering. But in reality, machine learning projects are still to some degree, some varying degree research projects. And so 100% success rate shouldn't really be the goal, right? Like you should be trying some stuff that isn't gonna work. Um, otherwise you're probably not being ambitious enough. But I do think that many machine learning projects are doomed to fail from the start because for example, they're, they were never technically feasible to begin with or they weren't very well thought out and they're, they're poorly scoped. You know, the, the projects kind of get stuck in proof of concept phase. They, they have a cool working demo, but the demo never makes it to production. Or, you know, the demo makes it to production, but it was, it's never really clear, like what the success criteria for the project is. So it never gets greenlit or, you know, all this just kind of falls apart because the team is managed poorly to begin with. And so, you know, so we're going to, we're going to talk about some of these things and how you can avoid some of these problems when you're picking and scoping machine learning projects. So what we'll cover today is we're going to start by talking about the life cycle of a machine learning project. And so this is really just meant to like get your, help you wrap your mind around all of the activities that you're going to need to think about if you're building a, an end-to-end -end machine learning project. Then we'll talk about how to pick projects, right? So how to prioritize which projects you should work on, which will boil out down to assessing the feasibility of projects and their, and their potential for impact. And then we'll talk about a few different archetypes of, of projects. So different categories of machine learning projects that you might embark on and what the implications of those categories are for how you might think about managing those projects. And then we'll talk about metrics. And so metrics are kind of the numbers that you look at when you're optimizing a machine learning model, how to pick, or why it's important to pick a single metric and how to pick that metric. And then finally, we'll talk about baselines. And so, and so baselines are essentially a way of, of really understanding whether your model is performing well or not. And so these last two are, are things that, that you should have in place before you even start you know, training models as part of the model development process. And throughout today, we'll, we'll keep coming back to this running case study. So the case study is pose estimation. And this is kind of inspired by a project I actually worked on at OpenAI. But the idea is that you know, we're... We're a hypothetical robotics company. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to predict the pose of objects from images of those objects. So the input to our model is you know, one or more images um, of some indoor scene that the robot's going to interact with. And what we're trying to predict is the position and the orientation of all the objects in that image. And so why, why is this important, right? So you know, it, it, throughout this running example, the, we're, we're working on this company called Full Stack Robotics, and we're working on robotic grasping. And the way our system works is that we have two different models that, that we're using. The first is the perception model, which is the model that takes images as input and produces, you know, the state of the world. So the positions and orientations of objects in our case. 
And then the second component of the system is the grasping model, which is, you know, takes those raw positions and orientations as input and produces motor commands for the robot um, to actually go and execute in the world. And, uh, you know, you might ask why, why is this split into two components instead of learning this model end to end? And this is a bit of an aside, but one of, one of the reasons that a lot of robotic system and systems in particular, self-driving car systems, et cetera, are, are split and are not just actually learned end to end, you know, re using reinforcement learning or something like that is, you know, a couple of the main reasons are data efficiency. So it can be, it can be cheaper in terms of the amount of data that you need to have and label to build a system like this. And then auditability, right? So if you have a model that just uh, regresses images against motor commands, then if something goes wrong, right, if, if the robot takes the wrong action, it can be really hard to diagnose what actually happened. And so in, in the real world, a lot of robotic systems are split like this, where there's a, a task of state estimation, where you try to predict like, what is the state of the world? And then on top of that, there's a task of control, right? So given the state of the world, what action do we want the robot to take? And, uh, and so, so that's why the, the system is broken up like this. All right, so, so diving into the, the main content of the lecture. So first thing that we're gonna talk about is how to think of the life cycle of a machine learning project. So all of the activities that go into creating a project like this. So the life cycle of a machine learning project really starts with this planning and project setup phase, right? So this is the phase where we might you know, decide to even work on post estimation at all, determine what our requirements are and what the goals are for the project, allocate resources to the project, you know, maybe this is less relevant for this project, but in other projects, we might consider the ethical implications of the work that we're doing, et cetera. And so once we have a plan, then we'll move into the, to the data collection and labeling phase. And this is where we might collect the objects that we want to train our model on, set up our sensors, like our cameras, and start capturing images of the objects, and then figure out some way to annotate those images with ground truth, which in this task might be kind of difficult. One thing to, to know about the life cycle of machine learning projects is that I think the right way to think about it is that machine learning projects are not a linear flow from you know, project planning all the way to deployment. They're actually a loop. And each of the stages, there's a bunch of opportunities to loop back to earlier stages as you learn more about your project or as you collect more data. So you, know, you might loop back from the data collection phase to the planning and project setup phase because for example, maybe you find out it's actually, you know, it's really too hard to get data for the, ta the task that we're working on. So maybe let's actually like try to refine this task or pose the task differently so that we can make our data collection and data labeling process easier. Once you've collected and labeled data, then you move on to the training and debugging phase. And so this is what I think most people think of as machine learning. But, you know, here you might um, do things that are outside of the, you know, what you, what you normally think of in training deep learning models. So you might actually implement a baseline model that is not using machine learning at all. Maybe it's just calling some open CV functions. But you also might do things like figuring out what the state of the art is and trying to reproduce that. You'll probably spend a lot of time debugging in this space, and we'll have a whole lecture on how to make that process less painful. And then thinking about how to improve the model, right? So once you have something that kind of works, trying to come up with better, better model architecture or something along those lines would also fit into this space. So training and debugging can loop back into the data collection phase. For example, you might need to collect more data if your model is, is overfitting. Or you might realize that, for example, like something about your data labeling process is unreliable. So you're able, unable to get good results. And one of the reasons why might be that your labels are inconsistent. You can also loop all the way back to the planning and project setup phase. So you could realize that the task itself was just way too hard to begin with. You could also realize that some of the requirements that you specified in the, the planning and project setup phase trade off with each other. So for example, a lot of times accuracy trades off with latency. Um, so you might actually need to get a model that's too big in order to, in order like to, to run in real time in order to solve the task to the accuracy requirement that you had. And so it might be important to go back and revisit which of those requirements were important. And then finally, once you have a trained model that you think is good enough, then you'll move into the deployment and testing phase. And so in this phase, you, you, know, you might run a pilot. So in our case, we might run our grasping system in the lab. And then you'll also test your model in this phase. So we might write regression tests to to prevent you know, any, any future changes from breaking things that are good about our model. And we might also write tests to evaluate our model for biases. And then once you, know, once you have your, your pilot done and your tests in place, then finally you'll roll your model out into production. But your job is actually not done here. So you could, you know, in a lot of cases, you'll need to loop back to the training and debugging phase. 
So you might realize that even though your model worked on your evaluation set just fine, it doesn't actually work in your pilot. It doesn't work in the lab. So you might actually need to keep improving the accuracy of your model. You could loop back to the data collection and labeling phase. So um, maybe there's some data mismatch between the data that you train on and the data that's actually seen in production. There's some distribution chip and you could go back and fix that. You could realize that you actually need more data. You were, you know, you were overfitting somehow. And so you need to go collect more data. Or there might be some edge cases that, that come up when you're deployed in production that you didn't know about in advance. And so you could go try to mine hard cases and, and maybe collect edge cases to retrain your model on. And in some cases, you actually have to loop all the way back to the project planning and, and setup phase. So for example, if the metric that you picked doesn't actually drive downstream performance. So for example, like if the metric that we picked was, was accuracy of the grasping model, but it turns out that you know, having the, the grasping model be accurate is, is not really enough. Like that doesn't actually make, the accuracy of the pose estimation model isn't really enough. Like that doesn't actually make our grasp more successful because for, for example, maybe we need more robust estimates of the un uncertainty of that model. You might have to go back and rethink the, the planning of your project due to that. Or you might realize that the performance in the real world just isn't that great. And so you could, you could revisit your requirements and say like, okay, what did we get wrong about those original requirements that we should um, take into consideration. And so these are activities that you'll do during a machine learning project that I would think of as like on a per project basis, but there's stuff that as a machine learning team, you'll need to solve across all of your projects as well. And so there's, you know, building the team and kind of hiring great people, managing those people. And then there's setting up the infrastructure and tooling that you need in order to actually do this stuff repeatedly and at scale. And so we'll have, we'll have lectures in the course that cover each of those as well. All right, so that's also not all that you need to know. It's also important to, to have some sense of what is state of the art in your domain, right? So what's, what's actually possible to solve using machine learning right now? And you know, if you're really deep in your domain, you might, this might be how you decide what to try next. And so we'll also introduce some of the most promising research areas in, you know, we, we talked a little bit about kind of basics of, of some of the most common deep learning tasks in the past few weeks. And towards the end of the class, Peter will give a lecture on promising research areas that you, that are worth keeping up with if you want to understand what's possible in machine learning. Okay. But to summarize, this is kind of how we think of the life cycle of a machine learning project and more or less the rest of the course will be oriented around trying to give you um, tools and techniques and ideas for dealing with each of these different phases. So next we're gonna talk about how to prioritize machine learning projects. And so what this is gonna boil down to is finding problems that are potentially high impact to work on and then trying to assess what the cost of those projects might be. So to, to um, double click on that a little bit, this is, you know, a general framework that you can think about for how to prioritize projects, like nothing machine learning specific here. But one way to think about project prioritization is that you want to look for things that are high impact or potentially high impact and are also relatively feasible, right? So those are the two axes that you might measure potential projects along. And, you know, you might plot your projects on, on this kind of two by two. And then the ones that are in the upper right corner, those are the ones to go and track, right? So it's not necessarily an exercise you actually need to do, but one way to think about picking projects is looking at what makes projects potentially high impact and what makes them feasible. So I think there's no kind of silver bullet answer to finding high impact machine learning projects. It depends on your use case and is just generally hard. But I do want to give you a few mental models for how to think about what types of machine learning projects might be high impact. And so the, the four I want to talk about are where can you take advantage of cheap prediction? Where can you automate complicated, where's there friction in your product that you might be able to automate away? Where can you automate complicated manual processes? And then, you know, the, the, the easiest one maybe is like, what are other people doing? So one lens to look at this problem with is through economics. So there's this book called Prediction Machines that lays out the case that at, at a high level, what AI enables you to do is it reduces the cost of prediction, right? So, you know, where a certain type of prediction might have required like an expert to spend their time to make this prediction. You know, machine learning allows you to like basically automate that expert into a system that you can run very cheaply. And so prediction is, is central for decision-making. And that means that if you have really cheap prediction, then 
prediction is going to be a lot more places, even for problems where it's too expensive before, right? Like most people couldn't like hire a private driver before. And so the implication of this, if you like take this lens to project selection is to look for projects where cheap prediction could have a huge business impact, right? So it's so a mental rule that you can think, that you can think about when you're looking for high priority projects. Another lens I think is worth looking at is thinking about it from the lens of like, what does your product actually need? And so this is from an article by Spotify, which I, I think of as kind of being like one of the best machine learning driven products. And I'll, I'll, I'll link to this article in a, a few slides, but the, the thesis that they lay out is that you should really be thinking about machine learning projects from a product perspective, and you should be looking for parts of your product experience that are high friction. And automating those points of high friction are exactly like where there's a lot of impact for machine learning to, to, to make your business better. A third heuristic that you might use is, you know, in addition to thinking about like the abstract economics of what AI enables and like what could make your product better, maybe we should just think about like, what is machine learning actually good at? Like where, you know, what, what are the nails that this, that this hammer can, can actually hit? And so for this, I, I like this, this software 2.0 blog post by Andre Karpathy. And, you know, I think he sums it up nicely in a tweet, which is uh, gradient descent can write better code than you. It's very nice of him to apologize for, uh, for insulting my code like that. But to, to dive into this a little bit more, the case that Andre lays out in this blog post is that what he frames as software 1.0 is kind of what most of us would think of as software, right? So traditional programs that have explicit instructions that are in most cases written by a human. Software 2.0 is a different programming paradigm where humans, instead of writing code, specify goals. And then an algorithm that um, searches for a program that solves those goals. And instead of working with code, software 2.0, you know, programmers instead work with data sets and those data sets get compiled into programs via optimization. And you, know, you might ask like, why do this? Right. And, and the answer, at least according to Andre is that it just works better. You know, gradient descent can write better code than you. But in addition to that, it's, it's also more general in some sense, because we can teach computers to do things that we can't easily articulate as rules ourselves. And there are also computational advantages. So if, if instead of having like all these complicated control flows in our programs, they're all just matrix multiplications, then we can design better hardware to, to, to suit those types of computations better. And so, you know, putting on our project selection hat here, the, the implication of, of this mental model is that you should look for places in your product where, or, you know, the, whatever you're working on, where there's kind of complicated uh, rule-based software where instead of having people design these complicated rules themselves, we can instead just learn these rules via data. So that's another, another way you can think about picking machine learning projects or which projects might be high impact. Another way I think is like, you know, it, that uh, is worth mentioning is that the, just the copycat approach, right? Like why, why reinvent the wheel? Like if you're, if you're working at a company, then in most cases, like, your company has a lot of similarities with other companies. So like, let's just look at what other companies are doing. So a uh, couple of resources on this I like. Netflix research published a, a talk where they talk about a lot of the different use cases of machine learning within Netflix, some of which you can see here, which I, I recommend checking out. This is from an industry report from a machine learning tools company called Algorithmia, where they, they surveyed a bunch of machine learning practitioners, like people in bigger companies, mostly about which use cases of machine learning they're actually, they're actually deploying. And one interesting thing to note here is how low all of these numbers are, right? So the, the largest one is 38%, 37%. So the, the overall penetration of machine learning, they found to be pretty low, which, which I think is interesting, but also the categories that people were working on are, are interesting as well. So there's a lot around, you know, reducing costs, which I imagine is probably mostly stuff like eliminating manual work around like document review and things like that, generating customer in insights and intelligence. So things like, you know, trying to predict whether your, whether your customers are going to churn or not improving customer experience. This is like, to me, kind of the most exciting category, right? Cause this is like actually building better products through machine learning, but then also a lot around like kind of internal process automation and more around like this customer, this, this efficiency thing. So this is, this is another lens into what other, what other people are able to get to work in the real world. You can also look at papers. I think, you know, the caveat here is that 
very a very small percentage of papers are actually like productionized and deployed in the world. But you can look at papers from kind of like the big tech companies, many of which are actually used in the, the real systems that they deploy. You can also look at blog posts, mostly from earlier stage companies. Most of these companies aren't really publishing a ton of papers about what they're doing, but often their engineering blogs have good case studies. And so this is, this is a list of 10 case studies on you know, making machine learning work in the real world at different companies that Chip Huynh compiled. And I would recommend reading through some of these as well to get, to get ideas about what types of things might be useful. All right, coming back to our framework for prioritizing projects. So we talked about some ways that you might think about assessing the impact of projects. And then the other, the other axis here is feasibility, right? So how do you know how feasible a machine learning project is gonna be or how much is it gonna cost? So I, I like to think of the three main kind of cost drivers of a machine learning project as you know, in order of importance being data availability, the most important, accuracy requirement of your project, and then the, you know, the intrinsic difficulty of the problem itself. And so let's, let's talk more about each of these. So within data avail availability, the main things to consider to, to tell whether, you know, data availability is going to be a, is going to be a big problem for your project is, you know, how hard is it to acquire data in the first place? How is, how expensive is it to, to get that data labeled? How much data are you going to need to, to solve your problem, which can be a hard thing to assess, but you know, and sometimes benchmarks can help you there. How stable is the data, right? So if you're working with data that is never really going to change, like your, you know, your, your model is going to always be deployed in the same environment and people are always going to interact with it in the same way. That's easier than if you're like in many machine learning use cases, your data is constantly evolving, right? So in recommender systems, for example, users behavior changes over time because, you know, the world changes. And maybe in some cases, their behavior changes because your model made predictions that caused them to change their behavior. So unstable data makes, makes machine learning projects a lot harder. And then lastly, one other thing I would consider is just data security requirements. So if you're, if you're working on a use case where you're able to just get all of the data that's going through your model back into some local place and you're able to look at all that data, then that's a lot easier than if you're never able to look at your users or your customers' data at all. So for accuracy requirements, uh, requirement, the main drivers here are how costly are wrong predictions. So if you're building a self-driving car, then wrong predictions can be catastrophic. But if you're building a recommender system, then you know a wrong prediction might just you know slightly annoy one of your users. So if, if wrong predictions are, are expensive, that can really drive up the cost of your project. And then how frequently does the system need to be right to be useful? So if you know if if you're able to, if like your recommender system, you know, like just getting one right recommendation out of every 10 that it shows, that's going to be a lot easier to build than if, you know, users will like log out of your app in disgust if they see one wrong prediction. And then lastly, like one other thing to consider here is the, the ethical implications of the accuracy of your model. So if, if, there's, if there's concerns about fairness or sort of you know, differentiated value to different, different classes of users, for example, then that can make projects a lot more challenging as well. And then in terms of like the intrinsic difficulty of the problem itself, like the technical difficulty of the problem, I think probably like the main problem here in practice is just, is your problem well-defined at all, right? Like, have you, have you scoped it out? Is it, is it really, is it really like structured as a machine learning problem? But there's other things to look at here. So is there good published work on similar problems? Right. If there's not a lot of published work on similar problems, then that means that there's probably more risk involved and more technical effort involved. When you're looking at the similar work, it's important also not to just look at you know, whether those, those, those works like achieve the accuracy that you need, but also what are the compute requirements, both in terms of training the models that they trained. A lot of state-of-the-art models now are incredibly expensive to train. And also in terms of how much compute is required to do inference on those models. So in the real world, you know, one common constraint is that the, the, the model in the paper like takes uh, a second or two to do inference. And so you can't actually run it in real time. And then lastly, like one other thing to consider uh, when you're assessing problem difficulty, if you don't, if none of these other heuristics give you a clear answer is just, can a human do this, right? So just try doing it yourself. And if you're able to solve the task, pretty well, then there's a reasonable chance that a machine learning system will be able to solve the task as well. If you can't solve the problem, given the same inputs that your machine learning system would have access to, 
then you know you should ask yourself whether this problem is really feasible. All right, I want to double click on this accuracy requirement for a second, because I think it can be a little bit counterintuitive that this is so important. But I think the reason why this is so, so important is that accuracy requirements for machine learning models tend to scale super linearly in, or project costs tend to scale super linearly in the, your required accuracy. So, you know, as you increase the number of nines in your required accuracy, then that tends to increase your factor, your, the, your project costs by like, you know, as a very, very rough estimate by like maybe a factor of 10 or something like that. So if you really need a model that's, you know, 99.99% accuracy, that's going to be a lot more expensive to build that model than if you only need 99.9% accuracy. And the, the fundamental reason for that is just that you typically need a lot more data and you need a lot higher quality labels to achieve these really high accuracy numbers. All right, I also want to talk a little bit about assessing the kind of intrinsic problem difficulty of machine learning projects. So I want to talk a little bit about what's still, what's still hard to do in machine learning, right? Like we see there's tons of success stories. There's a lot of things that seem possible. What's still hard to do? Be before I kind of give my answer to that, I want to just strongly caveat this by saying that it's historically very challenging to predict what types of problems are going to be difficult for machine learning to solve in the future. So you know, this is an article from the New York Times in the late 90s saying, you know, it might, it might be 100 years before humans beat computers in, or computers beat humans in Go, right? It, this is just, this is just, uh, this is just such a hard problem. Like computers are never going to be able to do this. But, you know, fast forward less than 20 years and DeepMind was the first, built the first machine learning system to beat humans in Go, right? So these predictions about what's going to be challenging in the future about machine learning can, can be, are notoriously tricky to make. That being said, I, I, I still think there's, there's, some, there's some interesting stuff that we, can, that we can say about this. So one, one heuristic that you'll hear is this, is summed up in this tweet by Andrew Ng, which is that like pretty much anything that a normal person can do in less than one second, we can now automate with AI, right? So I like to include this because I actually don't like this heuristic at all, but it's something that you'll see quite often. So the reason I don't like it is because I think it's like pretty easy to come up with counterexamples, right? So, I mean, some, some examples um, of this are true, right? So it's getting relatively easy for machine learning systems to recognize the content of images or understand speech or translate speech or increasingly grasp objects and other things like that. But there's also quite a few counterexamples. Actually, anyone have counterexamples in mind to this, to this claim that anything that you can do in less than a second, we can now automate with AI? couple that came to mind for me. So understanding humor or sarcasm, right? Like pretty easy for, for humans to do, or at least pretty easy for a lot of humans to do. Very, very difficult still for machine learning systems to do. In-hand robotic manipulation, right? So for humans, our hands are pretty dexterous. We can, you know, we can move objects around in our hands relatively easily, but that's still incredibly hard for, for machine learning systems to do. Generalizing to new scenarios, right? So if you, if someone shows you, you know, one example of a, like a shark giraffe or something, and then you see a picture of another shark giraffe, you, you can say like, yeah, that's a shark giraffe. But for machine learning systems, that still tends to be pretty hard. Although there are example, there are success stories of, of you know, in, in isolation, solving some problems like that, et cetera. So again, this is, this is something I like, I wanted to include because it is a heuristic that you'll see for assessing the feasibility of machine learning projects. But and I think it can be useful, but just you know, take this with a grain of salt. Like if you if you blank if you blanket apply this rule, you're gonna you're gonna end up working on some near impossible problems. I think a few things that I think are fair to say are still hard in machine learning are basically everything other than supervised learning. So unsupervised learning, you know, despite the success of like self-supervised learning in in NLP tasks is uh, like pure unsupervised learning is still relatively challenging to make work in the real world. Reinforcement learning, a lot of progress in academia, not a lot of real world applications at this point. And so bo both of these, it's not to say that you can't apply these, they're both showing promise in relatively little limited domains where you actually have a ton of data and compute available and the sort of domain itself is relatively constrained. But in general, you know, if, if someone, if you're proposing to do a reinforcement learning project in industry, you have to know that you know that's 
that's uh, probably more of a research project than a product than something that is immediately going to be production ready. So let's let's actually zoom in on supervised learning and let's talk about what's still hard there. So a few examples that kind of came to mind for me: question answering is still relatively hard. Summarizing text, although I think actually these two over the past year or two have become a lot more feasible to do. Predicting video, so given given some some sequence of video, what's going to happen in the next few frames? Building 3D models of the world, recognizing speech in the real world, you know, in the presence of noise and accents and all those sorts of things. Resisting adversarial example adversarial examples. Doing math is still something that's like kind of surprisingly tricky to get neural nets to do well. Solving word puzzles, solving bond guard problems. So bond guard problems are kind of these visual reasoning tests where you, you have like, you're given some like visual sequence of like shapes and colors, and you have to like reason about what's, what's missing on the other side. All these things are still things that are, are relatively hard to do, even in supervised learning. So let's try to like, let's try to, let's try to boil this down to some, some principles that we can think about in terms of what problems are still hard in supervised learning. So one category of things is where the, the output itself that you're trying to predict is complex. So maybe it's high dimensional or maybe it's ambiguous, like in, in the case of video prediction. And so some examples of this are 3D reconstruction and, and video prediction, but also dialogue systems and open-ended recommender systems, right? Like where you want your recommender system to be able to recommend any product that like users, that users input rather than trying to recommend something from a finite set of products that you define in advance. Another category of problems that I think are still really hard are problems where you really need reliability from the system. So where you need your system to be super, super precise or very robust to kind of perturbations or changes to the outside world. So one example, a couple examples here are, you know, models that fail safely on out of distribution data or are robust to adversarial attacks, or, you know, just need to do something to, to very high precision. And then a third category that I think is still really hard is tasks where generalization is required. So where you need to be able to perform well in out of distribution data, or you need to be able to do something that looks like reasoning or planning or causality. And so there's a couple examples here from self-driving cars. So edge cases are an example of out of distribution data and then control is, you know, increasingly learned, but historically was done use, using traditional planning algorithms in self-driving car companies. And then I think small data, like just, just generally data where you don't have large data sets still can be very tricky uh, to work with, with deep learning in particular. All right, so let's, let's, uh, let's make this a little bit more concrete. Let's come back to our full stack robotics example and let's talk about why we're focusing on pose estimation. So let's start by talking about the impact of pose estimation. So our goal as a company is to do grasping, right? And so in order to do that, we need to do reliable pose estimation. And let's say that you know, we were using a traditional robotics pipeline to, to do that pose estimation. And we were doing that using um, hand design heuristics and maybe some online optimization. And so that, you know, that causes some problems, right? It's, it's slow, it can be very brittle, um, and it's complex. So it might be a good candidate for software 2.0. Let's talk about the feasibility of pose estimation. So in terms of data availability, it's relatively easy to collect data for this task. We can just run our robot in the lab. Labeling data could be a challenge, right? Because we need to understand what the pose of objects in the 3D world is. So it might be hard for, for a labeler to do that, but we can get around that by just instrumenting our lab with enough sensors um, to be able to tell us the ground truth position of all the objects. In terms of the accuracy requirement, we do require pretty high accuracy to grasp an object. So maybe we need the, the pose to be correct to within less than half a centimeter, but the cost of failure is pretty low, right? We, we actually want our robot to be able to pick up a lot of objects per hour and if they fail a few times, then that's not a big deal. And then the, the intrinsic problem difficulty, this is you know, very similar to, to published results that exist, but you know, we're using a different robot and maybe some different objects, and so we'll need to adapt it. So it seems relatively low difficulty, but there's still some, cha some challenges there. Okay, so the last thing I wanna talk about in, in this section is just how to think about running a feasibility assessment for a machine learning project. Right. So what, like, what questions should you be asking yourself when you're trying to decide whether this project is feasible or not? The first question I would always ask is, are you, are you really sure that you actually need machine learning at all? Right. Oftentimes, like people do, people throw machine learning into a project because it's like fun or it's cool, but machine learning really in increases the complexity of projects. And so I think like making sure that you really need it before you embark on that project is a good idea.
once you once you're convinced that you actually need machine learning, then I think one thing that is that people don't invest in enough typically is putting in the work up front to like really define what success would look like for this project. So if there's other stakeholders in the project, this means working with them to, to determine like, all right, how accurate do we really need this thing to be before you embark on it? The next thing I think is pretty important to consider upfront is just what are the ethics of using ML to solve this problem, right? I think that it, a lot of times it, it can be tempting as engineers and researchers to say like, okay, it's our job to solve the problem, not to, de to determine whether our solution is ethical and that can create problems downstream. So think about this first. Once you've considered kind of those higher level upfront questions, then what I would do is I would conduct a literature review. I would look for other examples of people solving this problem in papers and you know, see how hard it seems to be to implement those papers. And you know, once, once you have a sense of what the techniques are, then I would try to like kind of rapidly build a labeled benchmark data set. So I would see like how, and so this is trying to get at like how feasible your data collection and labeling process is gonna be. If it's really, really hard to build this labeled benchmark data set, then you know, it's a, there's a good chance that it's like data collection and data, data labeling is always gonna be a bottleneck throughout the project. And then once you've kind of assessed the, the feasibility of data col uh, collection and labeling, then I would try to build like some minimal viable product, right? So you don't even necessarily need to train a model for this step. You can just like use some rules um, or maybe you train a very, very simple model, but this'll, this'll just give you a sense of like whether this problem is solvable at all and how good your baselines are. And then I think this kind of brings us back to the question of like, the last thing I would, once you've built this minimal viable product is I would ask yourself the question again, like, are you really sure? Are you really, really, really sure that you actually wanna use machine learning to solve this problem? like maybe that heuristic that you came up with is good enough for now. And so you should stick with the heuristic and move on. And those are some of the main questions I would, I would try to answer before you decide to embark on your ML project. The next thing that I'm gonna talk about is different, different archetypes of the types of machine learning projects that you might see in industry. And what are the implications of projects falling in those archetypes for how you, how you actually go about building and managing those, the, the models and the associated architecture around them. So different archetypes that we'll talk about. The first is, I'll borrow the name software 2.0 to describe this, right? And so this is, this is basically like anytime that you take a, a part of your system that exists already um, and is governed by rules and you improve those rules using machine learning, right? So maybe you have an IDE that does code completion and you want to improve your code completion algorithm using ML. Maybe you know you have a recommender system that's using you know matrix factorization approach, and you want to like use more complicated machine learning to make that better. Or maybe you want to you know you have a, a video game AI that's like using heuristics, and you want to build a better one using reinforcement learning. Second category of products that I, want, that I want to talk about is human in the loop, right? And so this is where projects where the output of your model is going to be reviewed by a human before it's actually like executed in the real world. So maybe you want to build a project to convert hand-drawn sketches into slides, and then someone will review them before, you know, before they go in your pitch deck. Maybe you want to do email auto-completion or help a radiologist do their job faster. And then the last category that I want to cover is autonomous systems. And so this is where the system itself is like making decisions in the real world with like no supervision from humans or limited supervision from humans. So full self-driving or fully automated customer support, or like instead of, you know, or like, you know, fully automating your website, uh, your website design. These types of things are, are autonomous and are going to be more difficult to build. So a few questions to ask yourself if you're building a project in each one of these, each one of these categories. So if you're building a software 2.0 um, product, I think like one of the main questions to ask yourself is like, are you actually improving the performance of the system? Um, so it's important to measure that. And does, does that performance improvement actually translate to value for your business or your product along like whatever axes that you care about. And then finally, like do those performance improvements lead to a data flywheel? And we'll, I'll talk in a second about what a data flywheel is and why that's important. If you're building a human in the loop system, the questions I might ask myself are, you know, how useful does this system actually need to be in order to be useful? Or how good does it need to be to be useful? How can you collect enough data to make it that good? And those are kind of the main questions I would ask. Those are sort of the, the, the main things that I think like drive project success for those types of projects. And then for autonomous systems, the, the main questions to consider is like, what is an acceptable failure rate for the system? How do you guarantee that your system won't exceed that failure rate? Like what guardrails can you have in place around it? And how inexpensively can you label data from the system? Okay, so I promised I was gonna come back to this data flywheel concept. 
So what is a data flywheel? Data flywheel is the idea that for certain machine learning projects or certain machine learning products, you can create this positive feedback cycle where as you improve your model, that improvement in your model performance leads to a better product. And that better product leads to more users. The more users you have, the more data you're able to collect. And the more data you're able to collect, the better you're able to make your model. And so I think this is kind of like, this is like a gold standard to aim for when you're building machine learning enabled products. Like if you're able to create a data flywheel, then your life is going to be a lot easier and you're more, more likely to build something that's going to get better over time. And so the, the kind of considerations here are, you know, when, like, where, where can things fail in the data flywheel, right? So do more users necessarily lead to more data? You, you actually need to like set up a system that will allow you to automatically collect data and ideally labels from your users. Do, does more data lead to, be, to a better model? It's kind of your job as the ML practitioner. Like if you, if you can't figure out how to turn more data into a better model, then you know, that's, that's on you. And then does a better model lead to more users? And you know, the question here is, do better predictions actually make, you know, does a more accurate model actually make your product better? And this is something that I would, I would, I would try to measure very carefully and ideally try to assess before you even start the project. So the, the next point I want to make on this is that, you know, there's, there's different trade-offs in terms of impact and feasibility of product, projects in these different archetypes. So autonomous systems have the potential to be super, super high impact, but are generally like very infeasible to create. Whereas like software 2.0 type projects, right? Projects where you're just trying to make an existing system better. You know, the, the potential for impact is lower because you do already have a system that's doing this job, but they tend to be easier to do because you already have data available. And then human in the loop is somewhere in between. But one way to, one other way to think about this is that the, the kind of impact and feasibility of, of these categories of projects is not, are not static. So you can make software 2.0 projects higher impact and also more feasible by implementing a data loop, right? So by, by building a system that allows you to collect data from the task that your model is solving so that you can improve the model going forward on this task and potentially on future tasks if you're collecting a, a broader set of data from your users as they interact with the model. You can make human in the loop projects quite a bit more feasible and potentially even higher impact through good product design. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next few slides, but you can also make these, these types of projects more feasible by, you know, just not trying to release something perfect from the beginning, Re you know, release a good enough version, get that out in the world as quickly as possible so that you can essentially turn this into a software 2.0 project. So zooming in on this, this good product design question, if you design your product well, that can actually reduce your need to have an incredibly accurate model. So some examples of this are, you know, when, when Facebook wants to tag, tag you in an image, they don't just tag you, right? Like, because, you know, then you get like these wrong tags and that would be a horrible product experience. So they would need to be very, very accurate to do that. They instead just suggest that you maybe tag yourself. So that's an example of product design reducing the need for accuracy. Grammarly is a tool that kind of helps like correct grammar problems in your writing. And, you know, again, they, like one thing that they do is they produce like explanations for why they're highlighting certain things. So it's not just like, this is bad. It's like, here are some rules that you might want to follow to make this better. And so again, the users have a chance to apply their judgment as to whether the suggestion is correct or not. And then recommender systems are another example of this, right? Just, just giving you like multiple suggestions for other things that you might um, want to pick instead of just like taking you to the next one. So there's, there's a lot of, I think there's a lot of like very underrated surface area in thinking about the, in, the intersection between like making machine learning projects successful and good product design. And so this, this is not a, a product design class, so we, we won't have time to do that topic justice, but I do want to point you to a couple of resources that you can go to to learn more about this if you're interested. So one, I think actually like super underrated resource is Apple's machine learning project product design guidelines. And so they kind of, they kind of urge you to ask like sort of three questions of yourself as you're designing your machine learning product. The first is what role does machine learning play in your app, right? You know, can you make it play less of a role to make it, to make, you know, to make it more feasible and that sort of thing. How can you actually learn from your users? And so they have a couple of different sort of design paradigms for how to incorporate feedback from your users, whether that's explicitly asking them for feedback, like, hey, was this a good recommendation or not? or implicitly ask, asking them for feedback, right? Like, 
did they click on the recommendation or not by asking them to calibrate during setup right so when you when you get a new iphone it, it asks you to scan your face to create a model of your face for face id or you know you could ask users to input a few movies that they like before you start making them recommendations and then corrections is another another pattern that they suggest so actually manually going in and fixing mistakes that the model make these all create a better product experience and they also make our lives easier as model developers because they give us data to to assess the model's performance and potentially retrain then the third category of things that they that they have some suggestions about how to think through are how your app should handle mistakes. So mistakes are an inevitable part of of the of you know what you're getting if you're building a machine learning enabled product. So handling those mistakes gracefully is pretty critical. And so they have suggestions like you know sh like show your users what the limitations of the model are, like articulate to them where you shouldn't expect the model to perform well. Corrections so letting your users succeed, even if the model itself fails, helping them understand where those suggestions are coming from so they can build a mental model of whether they should trust them or not, or explicitly telling them whether they should trust the results or not by outputting some sort of confidence. So again, kind of went through this pretty quickly, but recommend checking out this, this, this resource from Apple if you're interested in this. And another resource that I'll point you to is this, uh, these guidelines for human AI interaction from Microsoft. And so they, they have like kind of a similar set of heuristics that you should think about when you're designing a product that has machine learning embedded into it. And uh, yeah, one, a couple that I'll highlight here are so, you know, they, they have, they have some like potential patterns for how to handle wrong predictions, for example, which I think is a, one sort of design pattern that comes up both in like Microsoft and Apple's suggestions. And then, you know, different ways of adapting to feedback and learning from your users over time. So this is another resource that's worth checking out if you want to learn more about this. And then last resource, I, I, I alluded to this blog post earlier, but a blog post on machine learning product design from Spotify, which is a little bit higher level and less like tactical, but I think has like some good mindsets. And so the, their, their philosophical approach is like, find points in your product where there's friction. And then, and then basically like try to manually get rid of that friction and then try to automate the places where you're getting rid of friction using machine learning over time. Okay, so that's, that's some resources you can look at if you want to try to make your, your human in the loop system more feasible by, by like designing the product that sits around that machine learning model better. And so autonomous systems, you can also make more feasible. And the way that you typically can do that is by making them less autonomous, right? So you can add humans in the loop, you can add guardrails, or maybe you just limit the initial scope of the problem that you're trying to solve. So there's kind of examples of each of these tactics for making the problem more feasible in the self-driving car world. Humans in the loop is sort of the Tesla approach, right? Where like, they're just, you know, they're just running the system in the background and on all of your cars. And they tell you that you're supposed to be paying attention. And so when you like, when you jump in and like take the wheel from the system, that's, you know, that's, that's turning the autonomous system into a human in the loop system. Guardrails around the system in the autonomous vehicle world are things like safety drivers, right? So most autonomous vehicle companies are taking this approach where they don't actually let the, the AV run in the real world on its own, even if they mostly trust it, there's always a safety driver there that's like ready to jump in. And then limiting the initial scope of the problem. One company that's taking this approach is Voyage and their approach is instead of trying to solve the full self-driving problem from scratch, instead, let's just focus on like a narrow subset of this problem. And for them, that narrow subset is only focusing on um, senior living facilities where they can control their environment much more. And so they've said like, you know, even though the goal is to eventually build fully autonomous systems, we're gonna constrain the problem and try to solve the constrained problem first before we broaden our scope. So situating where we are in the lecture and kind of the life cycle of scoping out your machine learning project. So we've talked about like some ideas for how you might think about picking a project and then some like overall considerations that you might think about if you're, depending on what archetype your project falls into. So the next couple of things that we'll talk about are a little bit more tactical. And this is around metrics. So how to pick a single number to optimize and then baselines. So how to know if your performance um, on that number is good or not. So 
the, the main things that we'll cover in choosing a metric are, you know, the main things you really need to know are just that the, you know, the first thing is just the real world is very messy. And so in almost all cases, you actually care about more than one metric. Like you don't just care about one accuracy of your model. You also maybe care about things like the latency of the model or other metrics that describe your model's performance. But that presents a challenge because when you're actually doing the process of optimizing a machine learning model, training models, evaluating them, comparing them to each other, that process works best when there's a single number that you're trying to drive down. Okay. And so as a result, we need to have some way of figuring out like among all of the metrics that we care about, how do we pick just a single number that we'll care about right now? And you know, the, the important thing to realize here is that this is sort of a pragmatic thing that, that you'll need to do when you're when you're working on picking better, better models for your task. But that formula, that like single number that you're driving down can and will change over time. Right. So, you know, as, as you start to perform better against that metric, you'll come back and revisit like, okay, what should we really be optimizing right now? And so, and the last thing I'll say on this is just, you know, this, this sort of like single number view of the world, I think is an important mindset to have when you're in the model development process. But when you move on to kind of testing your model and evaluating it and deciding whether this model is actually like good enough to solve your task and go into production, it's important to zoom back out and talk about the other metrics that you might care about. And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that process in a separate lecture. But for now, our goal is to pick a single number that we're going to try to drive down and drive up. So to review, you know, why is it important that we pick a single number? So there's there's a few different numbers that if you're if you're doing like a binary classification task, there's a few numbers that are like natural to consider. So you know you have your accuracy, which is the the number of correct predictions divided by the to number of total predictions that your model made. And so in this case, the accuracy would be like 50%. Then there's the precision, which is another metric that you might care about, which is defined as the number of true positives. So where the actual answer was yes and the model predicted yes, divided by the total number of positives that were predicted, so both true and false positives. Then you have your recalls, which is the, the, the true positives divided by the, the number of times that the answer was actually yes. And so why is it important to choose a single metric? Well, let's say that we're comparing three models. And you know, we care about both precision and recall for those three models. And these are the precision and recall numbers that we get for those three models. Well, which one is best? Like, which one of those models should we pick to put into production or to you know, run more hyperparameter optimization on? And so that's why it's important to have like a single number in mind that you're trying to optimize at any given time. So next let's talk about strategies for how you combine how you can combine the metrics that you care about. The simplest thing which can work is that you might just like take a simple average or maybe a weighted average of the metrics that you're looking at. So in this case, like let's say that we just take the average of precision and recall. And in this case, that would sort of point us to model three as being the, the model that's best. In the real world, this is, I would say like less common to do. What's more common is to like, probably the most important of, out of all these techniques to know is an, this idea of taking, you know, if you care about n metrics, take n minus one of them where you're just gonna set a threshold on your performance according to that metric. And then you're gonna always pick the model that does the best on the remaining metric. And so often the way that this plays out is in practice is that like you'll, you know, you'll iterate on model architecture until you find a particular model that satisfies like your threshold on those n minus one metrics. So maybe those are things like, like latency or like total number of parameters or you know, cost to retrain or something like that. And then, and then most of your optimization process will be spent um, trying to drive a number like accuracy down on the nth metric. And, but each time that you do that, you'll kind of like choose perturbations to the model architecture and data and stuff that you're using that you think will like not make you much worse on the rest of the metrics. And so we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail when we talk about edge deployment. But, you know, for example, like, if you're trying to if you're trying to fit a model into the memory requirement of a particular edge device that you're working with, then you might start with a model that you know fits into that memory requirement, and then you know make changes to the model architecture, but never like increase the size of that model too much. 
so that you, you know, hopefully never get too far above that, that model size metric that you care about. So how should you choose which metrics to threshold and which metrics to actually optimize? So, you know, one way to choose is just, it's gonna depend a little bit on your domain, right? So for example, maybe there's some metrics that you can engineer around. So like maybe, you know, maybe latency, it's like important to have lower latency, but if the latency is higher, then like maybe there's some tricks like caching predictions or something that you can do. So you can engineer around lower latency, but maybe in your case, not lower accuracy. And so this depends on the domain that you're working on. Another metric, another way that you can choose which metrics the threshold are looking at which metrics are least sensitive to model choice. So maybe, you know, maybe your accuracy um, varies a lot between all the models that you care about, but your, your, your latency, let's say, doesn't really seem to vary that much between the different models that you're picking. So you might choose a threshold latency. And then lastly, at any given point in your kind of model optimization process, you'll, for all the metrics that you care about, you'll have some that are like relatively close to their desired values. And then you'll have some that are further away. And so a pragmatic decision that you can make is to say like, okay, let's just, let's just, uh, let's just threshold the metrics that are already pretty close. And let's just try to not make them too much worse. And then let's really focus on driving this one that's still pretty far away from our desired value down. And then once you've driven that down, then you can re reconsider. Other question you'll need to answer is choosing the value of the threshold. So like what constitutes, you know, performance on that metric that's bad enough to just throw that model out entirely. Again, domain judgment is going to be important here. So what is an accept acceptable tolerance downstream and what's achievable um, for the task? But another, another way that you can assess this is by is by looking at how well the baseline model that you're working with does on this metric. And we'll, we'll talk in the next section about baselines and why they're important and how to choose them. And then finally, you, know, you might have some sense of how important different metrics are at this stage in your project, right? So again, like if, you, you know, if your model doesn't work at all, then getting the model to work at all might be more important than you know, getting it to work within the actual production constraints that you're working with. So, you know, one, like one way we could apply this to this problem is we could just say like, okay, let's, you know, most of these models have a recall that's above 60%. So let's just set that as a threshold and we'll throw out any models that have recall less than 60%. And then let's choose the precision. Let's choose the, the model based on the one that has the highest precision subject to that constraint. And so in this case, model two would be that model. Then the last strategy that's worth um, considering for thinking about combining metrics is for some domains, like for some problem spaces, there's you know more complex or like domain specific formula that you can use for combining different metrics that you care about. So in binary classification, there's this metric called called the the, the mean average precision. So the way that the mean average precision works is you can plot the the trade off between precision and recall on a curve, right? So at a at a given recall. Like at a recall of 100%, what is your precision? Or at a recall of 50%, what is your precision? You can take the area under this curve and that's your average precision for like, let's say this particular class. And then the mean average precision is the average precision averaged over all of the classes that you're trying to perform a prediction on. So that's the map. And that's like an example of a domain specific metric that you can use. And so, you know, for the sake of example here, maybe the map would tell us that model one is actually the best model. So you might pick that. So again, th this is why it's important to put effort in thinking about how you're going to trade off between metrics up front, because in this, uh, in this example that we made up, each one of the metrics that you chose gave you a different choice for which model is performing best. All right, so let's, uh, let's come back to our running example of uh, full stack robotics and working on pose estimation. So let's introduce another metric that we might care about, which is prediction time. And so how we might go about choosing our, the metric that we're going to optimize first is we might start by just like listing what are our requirements? Like what, what do we think we're going to need to have in order for the system to work in production? And so again, our goal is to do real-time robotic grasping. And so we think that, you know, maybe the position error, I mean, it seems like it probably has to be less than one centimeter. Um, not really sure how precise it needs to be. Like maybe it actually needs to be much more precise than that, but for sure it needs to be less than one centimeter. And similarly, like maybe the angular error, we think that that might need to be within like five degrees or so in order for, in order for the grass to succeed. And we also, might have, we also might have a requirement that 
we think in order for this to really run in real time, it, the predictions must come in like less than 100 milliseconds. So the next thing that we might do is once we have a sense of the requirements, like let's let's figure out what the what our current performance against those requirements is. So we might train a few models. We might like kind of just come up with a, a couple of hypotheses as to what our model architecture would look like. You know, not put a not put too much effort into optimizing those things up front, but just train them and see where they fall on the performance curve. So in our example, let's say that you know they all tend to have a position error between you know or maybe around a centimeter, a little below or a little above, depending on the hyperparameters. But the angular errors that we're seeing are huge. They're like around 60 degrees. And the inference time is also way above what's acceptable for our system. This is actually kind of representative of where, where we were when we started working on some grasping tasks at OpenAI. It's like we had our position error, we got that down relatively quickly, but the angular error was really bad for some reason. And so the question is like, which of these things should we work on? So I think a, a pragmatic decision in this case would be, let's prioritize working on the angular error because that's really far away from what we think we're gonna need in order to make this system work in the real world. And let's threshold position error at one centimeter because we, we feel like pretty sure that if it's above one centimeter, it's not gonna work. So let's throw out models where our position error gets much worse than that. And you know, since we're so far away from actually getting the system to work in production, let's just completely ignore runtime of the model, right? Let's, let's get a model that solves the task, even if the runtime, even if the inference time is, is too long, and then we'll figure out how to, how to drive inference time down once we know that we can solve the problem. And then the last step that we would do here is we would just, you know, as those numbers improve, we would revisit what our metric is, right? So if like, if we figured out a bug in our, in how we're, you know, how we're labeling the angular, the, the, the angle, and that causes us to be able to drive angular error down to 10 degrees or something, then we might come back and say like, okay, now it seems like we're pretty close to, to what we, what we thought our requirements are, were so maybe we'll focus on latency so we can actually try to run this on the robot. Okay, so to, to review, choosing a metric, the real world is messy and you in the real world, you almost always care about lots of metrics, but our process of like iterating on models and building better and better models over time tends to work best when at any given time, there's a single metric that we're focused on, single number that we're trying to drive down or drive up. And so as a result of that, we need some like some rule for combining all of our metrics into a single number that we're gonna work on right now. And we covered some techniques for how to do that. And then the last thing, which I've emphasized a few times, but is very, very important is that like this formula can and will change and it's natural to go back and, and, uh, and revisit that as you make progress on the metric that you're optimizing. Last thing I wanna to cover today is baselines. And so baselines, the goal of baselines is to just to know how well your model is performing at any given time. So key points here are, you know, why do we need baselines? The reason we need baselines is that they give you a lower bound on how well you should expect your model to be able to perform. And the tighter that lower bound, the more useful the baseline is. Right? So, so baselines that are, that are better, that are more, that are closer to like the true best case performance are going to be more useful. So let's dive into this a little bit. Let's say that let's say that you have some loss curves that look like this, right? So you know you have you know the, you're training a ResNet, and this is what your training loss and your validation lo loss looks like as you train the model. So the question is like, what what is the implication for like what you should do next in your model building process, right? So if you actually just look at these the, at these loss numbers, that actually doesn't tell you enough to know what the next step is for for what you should do in this, in your model building process. So for example, let's say that you have a baseline that, you know, human performance on this task is like basically already exactly the same as how you're performing on the training set. Or in another case, maybe your baseline says that like, you're actually nowhere near human performance on this data set. And the, the, the thing I want to point out is just that if you have the same exact model, the same exact loss curves, but you have a different baseline, then that impl implies different next steps for your model building process, right? So in the first case where your baseline is basically exactly already what you're achieving on the training set, the thing that you need, the problem you need to fix is the gap between your training loss and your validation loss, right? So you're overfitting here. And so the next step would be like to try to reduce that overfitting somehow. On the other hand, if your baseline is much, if, if your training loss is nowhere near your baseline, then the problem that you should work on first is addressing underfitting, right? So you should try to figure out like, 
how to, how to even make your training loss closer to, to human performance. And you should do that before you try to address the gap between training and validation. So same exact model, same exact, exact loss curves, but different baseline imply different next steps. And so that's why it's really important to choose good baselines. So what are your options? Like where can you go to look for baselines? So some baselines I would call like external baselines. So external to your, to your model building process. So you might have some requirements. You could use those requirements as a baseline. Or you could also like go, go and do a literature review and, and look for published results on maybe similar problems. This can be a good way to get baselines. There's kind of a caveat here though, which is that it's, it's often easier to, easy to delude yourself into thinking that you should be able to perform exactly as well as some published results. But in reality, you know, your data set is probably different. And so it's, it's not always gonna be a fair comparison. So just, just be careful when you're comparing to published results. Then there's some internal baselines. So in baselines that you can develop yourself. One of the most important categories here, which we've mentioned a couple of times already are scripted baselines. So just come up with some like heuristics or rules for solving your problem. Maybe use OpenCV, maybe like, you know, try to try to tune an algorithm yourself. And this is, this can be a really powerful baseline. And just, just to give you a sense of like how important this is when OpenAI was starting to work on the, the project to beat the best humans at Dota, one of the first things that they did is like one of the best engineers on the team spent literally months just trying to build like the best Dota bot that, that he could build by hand. And it turns out that he was able to build a better Dota bot than the Dota developers were able to build. And so once they had that, then they were confident that they had like a reasonable baseline where if the model was better than that, that, that sort of hand designed Dota bot, then that would mean that the model is actually like learning something. You can also use a simpler machine learning model as your baseline. So like you can use a linear regression or something like that to give you a baseline. And, you know, if your model is not able to, if your deep learning model is not able to perform better than that, then it's a pretty good sign that there's, you know, there's something wrong in how you're building your model. Maybe you don't have enough data. Maybe there's a bug, something like that. And then lastly, human performance. And so human performance. Oh, one other thing I want to mention on simple baselines. These don't actually have to be ML at all, right? Like one, you know, even if nothing else, like a reasonable baseline might be like the average of the outputs in your data set. And I've like, I've had cases where, you know, you're working on training a model and, you know, it seems like the model is not performing that well. And then you just compare its accuracy to just like taking, taking the average across your data set. And it does worse than that. Right. And so even that as a baseline is like pretty reasonable way to, to, to give you some sense of what, whether your model is learning anything. But coming back to human performance, so human performance can be a really powerful baseline because it can give you a sense of, you know, it, it can be, it can be a very tight, very tight lower bound in the sense that it can be, you know, it, it could be almost as well as you can expect the model to perform, especially if the, especially if you're reliant on labels from humans to, to create your performance. So there's better ways and there's worse ways to create human baselines. And there's kind of a trade-off in, in collecting, in measuring human performance on a data set between how good the baseline is, like how, like how close it is to like the true baseline on the task and how easy it is to collect the data, right? So on one hand, you can like, you can just give the task to like random people on Amazon Turk or something. And that's like super easy to do, but generally low quality, unless you really think through how to explain to people how to solve the task. Slightly better is to you know, instead of just paying like one person per task, you can pay a few people and you can like ensemble the results that those people produce. So a little bit harder to collect because it's, you know, you just, it's just a little more expensive, but the quality of the baseline is better. You can pull in domain experts, which in some domains like medicine is absolutely necessary, but in some cases, like just training people a little bit more to do your task can make your baseline better. You know, you can maybe even pull better, better experts, like someone who's really a specialist in what you're trying to solve, or you can like, you can ensemble those experts. You can do like a mixture over what those experts say. And that's maybe like the most expensive way to create a baseline, but will be the highest quality. So, you know, how, how do you actually choose where on that trade-off makes sense for your task? I think like one way to think about it is you want to, you want to aim for the highest quality that you can, that will allow you to like label more data relatively easily down the road. So, you know, if you, if you have like if you have a budget of hundred dollars for labeling for your entire project, then like don't spend all hundred of those dollars on labeling the initial data set, you know, cause you want like the best doctors in the world to label it for you. More specialized domains. So like the, the less generic your task is, the more you're gonna just need skilled labor, labor uh, labelers 
And you can be intelligent, you can be more intelligent about how, how you, like which data you choose to label by looking at cases, for example, where your model performs worse and concentrating your data collection on those kinds of places. And we'll talk about this more in the data lecture. All right, so the, so the main points that we covered on choosing baselines are, you know, the, the reason why baselines are important is that they give you a lower bound on how well you should expect your model to perform on this task. And so the better that lower bound is, the more useful this is as a baseline, because it gives you more confidence that your model is actually performing well and not just, you know, say memorizing the data or, you know, doing something stupid. Okay, so just to wrap up, what, what did we cover today? First thing that we talked about was the life cycle of machine learning projects, right? And so the, the main points to take away there are, you know, I think like maybe, maybe the most important takeaway um, for me in, in that piece is that you should think about the life cycle of a machine learning project, not as like a linear, you know, start from step one and go to step N, but as an iterative process where at each step you're, you're you know, working on the task at hand, but you're also maybe looping back to earlier steps as you learn more about your problem or build a better model. But it's other takeaway from this is that the other implication of this is that the sooner that you can deploy something quickly to kind of complete the cycle, the, the easier it's going to be to iterate on that. So after that, we talked about prioritizing projects and we talked about some heuristics for how to find high impact projects and, and, and projects that are relatively feasible. And like the, the main takeaways there were that you really want to look for projects where, you know, it's, it's relatively feasible to collect data and where the, the cost of wrong predictions is not going to kill you. So after that, we talked about like a few different kind of high level archetypes that you can use to think about what type of machine learning project you're working on and maybe how to make it easier to solve your, to solve the problem for that type of project. And so, you know, one point that I want to emphasize here is that in many cases, the secret sauce to like making these projects really work well, like really improve over time is um, to build automated or semi-automated data flywheels. But another point that you might take away from this is that Machine learning engineering is tightly coupled with doing good product engineering and product design. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can make your project more feasible just by making better product choices about how your, how your uh, model is integrated with that product. So then we talked about metrics. And you know, the, the main point here is that in the real world, there's a lot of metrics that you care about around your model. But at any given point in time, you should always have one. And then you should revisit that as your, proje as your project evolves and rethink whether that's the right thing to be optimizing right now. And then finally, we talk about baselines. And so the point of having good baselines is that good baselines help you invest your effort in improving your model in the right place. And so if you have a better baseline, then that gives you a sort of more granular sense of what the problem with your model right now might be. And so that's, that's why it's important to invest in good baselines. And we talked about a few different ways of building baselines. Okay, also wanted to drop in a few more resources if you're interested in learning about this topic. There's a lot um, to learn about here. And so we, you know, we, we covered a lot, but we also in some sense only scratched the surface. And so here are some resources that I would recommend checking out. All right, and that is all. Happy to stick around and answer more questions. 